Well, ladies and gentlemen, joining me finally, I've only done this for about two and a half years, uh, on the experience, uh, a guy who's been a wrestler, a booker, a producer, a manager, an author, and now if, if he's not a stand-up comic, he's at least a teller of amusing anecdotes, and the first male wrestler that I ever managed, uh, the filthy one himself from Oil Trough, Texas, Dirty Dutch Mantel. Dutch, thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you for asking me. I've been I was wondering when you were going to have me on since you were my first manager. And uh That's I it. That's you right. I was me. your first manager also, and you were my first protege. No. There was one before me. Well, my first male protege, I should say. Yes, uh, there I'd you sure. go. See, that's what I'd... that's the trivia game. People miss that. So I said, "Who was the first person Jimmy Cornette managed? It wasn't me. It was Sherry Martell, correct?" But I, yes, but I only had Sherry for that weekend, and then Plowboy. Yeah, Sherry but still, it's, it's still that's why it makes it so trivial. It was such <laughs> a short run. So, well, I've been doing a show forever, but for most of that time, you have been contractually obligated not to express many of your own views in public, which is why you haven't been on the program. But now that the muzzle is off. Uh, not only are you doing this show, but also you're doing a tour of, of comedy clubs and, and one man shows and et cetera, et cetera. What do you call them? I, I don't, I don't say I'm doing stand up because sometimes I sit down and well, I, you know, what do you call your shows? Well, bullshit mostly, but it's good <laughs> bullshit. There's, there's a, there's a difference between the bad bullshit and the good bullshit. And I do the good part. So, uh, my next appearance will be September the 15th in Chattanooga at the comedy catch or the catch comedy. I get it confused, but I'll, I'll be over there for one night. Then I got three nights coming up in Chicago. Then I have one night in October in, uh, in, uh, in Tampa. So I'm getting out there. I'm what I'm trying to do. I want to be the first person that's killed two genres in one lifetime. I've killed the wrestling business. Now, <laughs> Now I'm doing my damnedest to kill the comedy business. I could probably kill the comedy club in three jokes or less. So I was just in Indianapolis, and uh, I probably killed that club dead or in hell. So, but it takes a pro to do that. You just can't bring in a regular person to kill things. You, I mean, you got to really have a pro to do that. And that's why I've always said on independent shows, you know how you make more money on independent shows. And I've been on some horrible, horrible independent shows. This is what I've come up with. I have to watch seeing hundreds of them. Let the people in for free and then charge them to get the fuck out. Yeah. Because you would make a hell of a lot of money. Some guy say, I'll give you $100 just to get away from this bullshit. You say, and he kick him right in the ass and get the hell out of here and take this little rug rat with you and don't come back. So that's how you make a lot of money. See, you only got to draw like, say, 20 people and you have a $2,000 house and people leave after the first match. So you only got to pay two wrestlers. You can save a lot of money. So... When the economic value of that finally sets into some of these people, you may see that uh, that model instituted. Actually, there was a show I was on recently with Ricky Morton, and I, I told him about halfway through it. I said, I'm not a religious person, but I now believe in hell. Between the, <laughs> between the temperature and the length of the program and the fact that we were going to be at the end of four hours, and by two hours, the heat had driven away half of the audience – I, I, I said, you know, yeah, that, that we could have instituted your, your formula there and probably made twice as much money as we did charging people to get out of that place. I would have given body parts to get away from that show at that point. Yeah, I read about that. I, I, I think you posted something about it, how bad it was. So, you know, on independent shows, when you go, you know, like if you're in the – if you're in the wrestling business profession and you're working like WWE or even working the territories back in the day, you knew everybody. But when you go to some of these independent shows, you hardly know anybody. Who knows? The guy could have just murdered his whole family before he got there, and you don't even know it. Or he could have robbed a 7-Eleven, or he could have stole a car, or he could be a hell out on uh, – you don't know. So when you walk in some of these independent dressing rooms, basically you don't know what you're walking into. So it's kind of a – kind of a scary feeling sometimes because you could be sitting there with murderers and rapists and I don't know a or, lot of people it, that you wouldn't want to be associated with it could be worse you could be in there with wrestlers <laughs> yeah that that is that is pretty bad but uh what is the craziest wrestling story and dressing room story you've ever been around 
Oh, my God. Why are you asking me? You ought to be telling us that because they're in your book. Well, I want you to start so I, you give me a good basis so I can get started. So, <laughs> so that's, that's the way it used to work. I get somebody talking, then I just cut their asses off. So, now, nah, let me tell you a goddamn story. This is the story. So, And in wrestling, I like people, and you've heard this too. You know, people say, well, listen, I don't want to say nothing bad about the guy. And then you know the next words out of their mouth is going to be just a full face slam. See, I don't want to say nothing bad about the guy, but he's a no good son of a bitch. Yeah, how many times you heard that? And, he was and you it. and you didn't hear this from me, but and here it comes. He he was he was doing the best he could. He really tried hard, but this thing was the <laughs> shit. It's oh, it was minor fucking problems. horrible. And it was terrible. Well, it, so it, anyway, it, Jimmy, I remember. I remember that I was thinking about the days when you first managed me in Memphis, and I was thinking back. You know, I had a career. I had a career going pretty good, and then I met Jimmy Cornette, and boy, he just put the skids on my career. I was talking to all kind of big time promoters, and then after I got with you, I put the skids on it. So, yeah, no, but I really enjoy. I was telling the story the other day. Remember the time you had just started, and we were coming back from Memphis, and you had bought that. And you just started. You'd bought a new car, I think. And we were riding back from Memphis, and we got to around Jackson or something, and I had been out partying the night before or something. So I went to sleep, and, and I laid the seat down. And I looked up, and you didn't you didn't notice me, but you were so intent on driving. And your hands were on the wheel, and your eyes were... Your eyes were wide, and it's like you were really deep in thought. And I didn't know where where you were, but you wasn't in that car. You was like in goddamn South Georgia, some fucking place or something. And all of a sudden, I sat up and I went, bam! And oh my god, we went. Eek, eek, eek. You know the scene in uh, planes, trains, and automobiles where the guy scratches the dashboard with his fingernails. That's well, what I was doing, well, and I thought, I, I swear to God, I thought we were. They had a bridge coming up, and I thought we were going to go right down the median, <laughs> right into that damn river. That was the last time I ever scared you. I never no, did that again. No, you, it was the last time you ever scared me when I was driving. You scared me as recently as when we were in T and A, just uh, <laughs> coming around the corner of the building. You still got I'd climb people's frame or slap them in the face or whatever. I punched Riggy Morton in the thing of the eye one time when somebody goosed me from behind. But that time in the car, when you went, bam, it at just breaking that silence and that calm, I hit the brakes and locked them up. And then I scared myself and the, my French fries that I had between my legs flew up in the air. And we went sideways down and then it scared you. So then you started screaming and we were both, oh, yeah. I think we had a we had we had immediate silence for about five minutes. <laughs> you didn't look at me. I didn't look at you. We was getting our breath. I, but, seriously, but I, th I thought you 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 had us in an accident. You had us in a wreck. Me here. Here's the, here's the thing. We had been together. I think that was the weekend. The previous twenty four hours because and this is an example. Uh, in the middle of all this tomfoolery and falderall, this is an example of how the wrestling business used to work. The previous day, you had told me, pick me up in Nashville. You'd said Ted to me, pick me up in Nashville, and, and you can drive me to the spot show because that was the week I had signed you and I was managing you. Mm -hmm. And and you said, pick me up and you can drive me to the spot show. And while we're in the car, we will talk about what we're doing on TV Saturday morning. So we went from Nashville to Covington, Tennessee, or wherever it was that day or that night. And then went on that night to Memphis, and by the time we got to Memphis, you had led me through <laughs> the process of figuring out what we were going to do in the terms of what Jerry Jarrett had said, the booker had said was, okay, you signed him last week, and, you've, and, and we're going to show the footage from Memphis where I got excited because I was a rookie manager, and I didn't know what I was doing, and the referee was down, and I got excited, got in the ring, and got you disqualified, cost you the match with Lawler for the Southern title. And obviously after they showed that footage, we were going to come out and you were then going to tell me that you didn't need me anymore. And you're going to fire my ass. Right. And yes. apart from that, that's what they told us to do. So we had to come up with a way to, to go three or four minutes on live television in front of 300,000 people and somehow make that somewhat palatable and entertaining. So that's when you came up with the way that you would interview me and well, Jimmy, I need to find out if we're going to be compatible 
Do you stay up late at night and watch cartoons like Yosemite Sam and drink beer and smoke dope like those NFL football players that was in the news? And, oh, no, Dutch. Well, I'd never, I like to get up early and watch Richard Simmons and get exercise in the morning. Well, J- Jimmy, do you like to go out to bars and saloons and... <laughs> <laughs> and that whole nine yards, and basically all I had to do, because I didn't know what I was doing, all I had to do was give you the answer. You asked me all the questions. I gave you the proper answer that you'd come up for, the, the what I would say. And then you proceeded to tear the contract in half, tear the picture in half, break my pen, throw it down, tell me you, you weren't like the other guys. You didn't mind taking me for a ride because you'd been a heel, and that's what people liked about you. But I was an idiot, and this was over with. Walked off from me left me fuming that I'd spent all my mother's money on you. It was, and we made that up in the car. Yep. That's the way it used to be done. You know, when, and you know, as well as I do, some of my greatest ideas have come and yours too, I'm sure while you're driving. Yes. You know, you just, the way we used to do Memphis and when Jerry, Jerry booked it and we would be, when I would ride with Jerry or, you know, Lawler on Tuesdays or whatever, that's when we'd book the, We'd book the TV, and the next week, you would book it on the way back from Memphis. And because you were coming from a, from the house show, you were coming from the live event, and you were going, you had two or three hours to kill three, and so you had plenty of time, you had plenty of time to book it, and it was fresh in your mind, and it, it was it was easy to book. Now, when you go to book a show on a committee, it's like pulling teeth (laughs) because you go in there and you've seen this too. You have this great idea. You walk in this committee. Guys, I got this great idea. So it starts with you at the head of the table or the middle of the table or wherever you are. And it goes to the next person and the next person and the next person. By the time it comes back around the table again, the whole thing has changed, even with the personnel. It may not even be the same people you laid out to start with. They had changed it all. And then whoever's in charge of it, or they say, "Oh, that's good. Let's do that." Well, hell, it's not even what you come up with. Well, and that's, when, that's the that's the reason. That's why I hate working with committees. That's why I did so good in Puerto Rico because I would go out on the beach <laughs> and I would sit down with my bottle of Malibu rum. Senor Malibu was my booking assistant, and I would sit there on the on the beach. And and Senor Malibu had great. Great ideas. He was very, very <laughs> astute. He was very astute in booking. And by the time the day was over, I would stay out there with my one man booking committee. And when I come in, I had a great idea of what I was going to do on Saturday night and put on TV. And I didn't have to run it by anybody else. I was down there one time with Eddie Gilbert, you know, rest in peace, Eddie, great guy. But Eddie, he loved to book. He he loved that. He lived for that. He loved the so process what? of it, right? Every, putting everything yeah. on paper and everything. I can kind of identify with some of that too. It's it's like a, a well. Love. That's what I hated about it. You put shit on. See, on- I shared the Jerry Lawler, you know, the model of booking. I, I called it Memphis Rules. Make it up as you go along. That's what I did in Puerto Rico. So one day, we would do the in Puerto Rico. We would do. I brought I brought Eddie in, and he was living in the same. Uh, apartment place I was living in. It was right there on the beach. Beautiful place. And uh, we're sitting around the pool at 4 o'clock. The show starts at 8.30. So, and Eddie was sitting there, and he was dying to ask me, what are we going to do tonight? And I went, and I wouldn't talk about it. And he says, uh, Dutch? Yeah, what? What are we going to do tonight? I went, I don't know. <laughs> I hadn't really <laughs> thought about it. He went, What? What do you mean you hadn't thought about it? I said, well, I just hadn't put a lot of thought behind it, really. He says, well, it's it's 4.30. I said, well, Eddie, I'm well aware of the time. I know what time it is. He said, well, when are you going to think about it? And I went, well, I guess, Eddie, when I get to the building, I guess I'll start thinking about it. And he couldn't he couldn't imagine that. He couldn't <laughs> fathom that I wouldn't just spend every waking moment talking about what we're going to do or thinking about what we're going to do on Saturday night. And this was this was this was this is how I booked Puerto Rico. I would walk in the building, and the building they're supposed to start at eight thirty. Nothing ever started on time in Puerto Rico. They have Puerto Rican time. It's like if it's supposed to be eight thirty, well, that's more like nine twenty three or a quarter to ten. That's wh- whatever. It's when the people get there. So when I walk in the building, I would order me two pina coladas, 
because they had an a, a open wet bar there, just open bar. <laughs> and I'd get me two beers, and then I'd drink the pina coladas first, then I'd start on the beer, and it'd take me about uh, 15 minutes to get rid of the pina coladas, then I start on the beer. That's when I start thinking about the show. And then I would walk out, and then I would see the crowd coming in, and I would get the vibe from the crowd, then I'd go in there and go to work. And that's how I booked Puerto Rico. And sometimes I just make it up in the middle of the show. Change this, change that, do this, do that. <laughs> and I had a guy, and I would shoot all these vignettes in the back. Whether I used them or not didn't matter. Sometimes I'd do like 20 vignettes in the back just because I was half drunk and having a good time. <laughs> and I would give them to my little videographer who I called, who, whose real name was Hector, but he was like, he was moody all the time. Moody, One day he moody wanted to kill him. Moody, you remember him, Moody. And uh, I would give them all to him, and he'd straighten them out, and we'd have a we'd have the show that's for the TV show next next week. And see, Moody, he was he was a he was a huge wrestling fan, and I, I loved him to death. But he was, I think, a little bipolar because one day he was great, he was just up sky high. The next day he was down, and he wanted to kill himself. Then the next day. You wanted to kill him and kill yourself at the same time. That's how he affected you. But he was very good at what he did, and uh, he he was really a, a huge, huge fan of professional wrestling, which is a big plus because I needed his enthusiasm sometimes. Well, now, I, I some that a lot of people don't remember or, or they weren't there at the time, so they don't understand, is when you talk about booking either Memphis or Puerto Rico – even in Memphis, you're riding with Jerry Jarrett. He's the boss, but he tagged off to different bookers at different periods mm-hmm. of time. So, and and you might have to consult, you know, the top guy in the territory. In Memphis, it'd be Lawler with what's going on with him or whatever. But otherwise, you know, you had a free reign to do this stuff. Like you said, it wasn't about a committee. And also, you didn't need to put every one foot in front of another, put every word in a guy's mouth because you were dealing the preliminary guys, the – undercard guys they were just booked to go out and have matches and wrestle and yep. one of them win and that's it that's it that's and it then in the in the main events you had veteran established talent who had drawn money themselves before and you gave them reasons to be mad at each other or things to say to each other might that might cause controversy or a way one of them might fuck another one around and then just like <laughs> you and i did in the car you they they made up their promos based on uh, what whatever the incident was, and and they they had their matches because they knew what got over for them. It wasn't you hiring somebody and trying to tell them, okay, now you're going to be a ballet dancer from Pittsburgh. Yeah, that's it. The way the territories used to work for those who don't remember them. Let's take let's take two guys, two old time guys would be uh, Johnny Valentine and Wahoo McDaniel. They would follow each other all across the country, and say one of them was going to go to Texas. And Wahoo was his, he had drawn money with him in Charlotte in the mid Atlantic. And about two months later, you'd see Wahoo show up there because Johnny said that we'd tell the booker down there, let's bring in Wahoo and we can do this deal we did in mid Atlantic. And it draws yeah. like a, and the booker, of course, if you hear about somebody that's going to draw a few bucks, you're going you're gonna to draw some houses with this with this guy bring him in that's the way it used to work some crews used to follow each other around not just one or two guys but like three or four guys they would just bring their whole clique in there they would run for a year hard a year and a half then time for them to leave that's what i liked about the wrestling business because it didn't used to get old because when things got old you know that's when your business dropped off then it was time to change now when business drops off in wwe but it's, it hasn't dropped off i mean they they're still they're drawing huge huge houses but well, well, but the, 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 the booker... twenty years ago, twenty years ago, see Vince had all these. He had all these territories doing his developmental work for him until he ran them out of business. Now he had to start developing talent on his own, and it took him about I don't know. It took him five to ten years to really get get the system back to where it's working in his favor again. Well, that it, NXT thing is pretty hot now. You got to remember. The promoters in those days, they didn't want to keep guys for the most part. They wanted to keep them while they were drawing, but they didn't want to keep them forever. They were nope. dating. They weren't married. So except for you know, the Memphis ter- Territory, Jerry Jarrett wanted to keep Jerry Lawler. Eddie Graham in Florida wanted to keep Dusty Rhodes. 
Maybe the same thing could be said for Barnett in Georgia. But he definitely went to Ole because Ole was his guy that booked and was a top star. Mm-hmm. Also. They're your key guys in in each territory. Otherwise, they wanted guys to leave on, on a regular basis. If they drew money in that territory, if they left, they could go somewhere else for a year or two and work and draw money, and then they could come back to that territory fresh and draw right. big crowds all over again. Or if they didn't draw, they'd never bring them back. And they didn't feel nope. bad about it because well, they had like, like, other place to work. Like you said about Florida, Dusty. Dusty was the face of Florida Championship Wrestling. Dusty was the, the resident baby face. He was always there. Like like Lawler Memphis, he was the resident baby face. Bruno and the old W. WWF or whatever you used to call it, yeah. he was the resident baby face, so he just stayed there forever. And uh, the, the Texas, of course, had the, the Von Erics, and they were your resident people always. And that's what they would do. And they would just run heels. They'd run heels by them. They were heel coming. You could almost set a timetable. Say a heel would come to Memphis. He would have two months' time to get over before he got in the angle with Lawler. And then he would have about three, four, five months maybe with the angle with Lawler. Now, he's already there seven months. And by the time nine months, ten months is up, time for him to go and he knew it and uh jerry jarrett or whoever was booking it could bring another heel in and then it was always fresh it never really had time to get old because if you see that person on tv week after week after week you go god he's out here again oh my god because bill watts said this one time he said he always turned an angle off before the fans turned it off and, yeah, well, and, and, and I don't know if that was true, but that's what he said. You know, sometimes brilliant words come out of people's mouths that's <laughs> that funny. they may have heard somebody else say, and they don't even employ it. Well, I always, I always said, how can I miss you if you won't go away? But it's the same thing. But it, it's now the problem has become with national wrestling. Wrestling was never meant to be national. If you're watching the same crew on national TV over and over again, then sooner or later you get tired of all those people and there's nobody to take their place. And for companies to have to keep guys under contract because they can't go to the competition, whereas the promoters used to want guys to go to the competition out of their territory, freshen themselves up again, learn how to do something, pick up a new gimmick, learn a new hold, as Jim Ross used to say, and come back even better. Now they don't want them to leave until they're useless so they can't draw any money for their competition. That's so right. when they leave when they're useless, and then they have nowhere to go to reestablish themselves as stars except for TNA, which, is, of course, you know, is, is uh, now on – are they on the Internet still at this point? <laughs> and, well, no, uh, I – because, hey, let me ask you this. You 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 know Billy Corgan from he he used to come to the matches. I've talked to Billy Corgan at TNA shows years ago. Never never met him. Did you never meet him once? Nope. Well, I mean, you know, he was there a number of times, and I talked to him. You know, just he's he seemed like a very intelligent fan. From he was, he was there. He was business. there. Where? It, where he was, was he? He would come and and visit and watch the tapings in Orlando at Universal. I, I didn't know that. Never I, met him. I've met him three or four times. I guarantee you. But because that was probably probably I didn't meet him because I was hiding out most of the time down there, so I couldn't be found. Well, it, it was, was always they they didn't let him because he wasn't working for the company then. So he was a guest. Some of the guys, so they didn't let him in the air conditioned building. I was trying to get away from shit stain, so I'd be out there in the heat. You were trying to find the air conditioning. So. But anyway, he's an intelligent guy from another line of entertainment. But at this point. I guess what I'm asking you is for for our old uh, our old company there has have they seen the worst? Is anybody better than Dixie? Now that Dixie uh, had, doesn't have the pull to draw a greasy string out of a cat's ass, and she's trying to get out of there. Jimmy, now she she speaks face. very Jimmy. She speaks very highly of you. <laughs> I'm sure. She and does. you see how you're talking about her. <laughs> Um, no, these, I, I don't know about these, TNA. It's a, it's an enigma to me. That's another word for mystery. And it's, uh, it's always been an enigma to me. And I've worked for a lot of different companies, but that one was a, kind of a strange, strange relationship for a number of years. But uh, I, I want everybody in the wrestling business to do good, and I wish them the best. I really do. So, but it was a uh, working in TNA was a uh, kind of a. An it was an experience, and again, an, an experience, and one that you know that was. I couldn't explain it even when I was going through it. I mean, I'm saying, 
I, I wrote in my book, you know, I wrote two books. And one's called Tales from a Dirt Road. That was my second book. And I wrote that on the beach, by the way, in Puerto Rico, too. Uh, I wrote it in five weeks. And the first book I wrote, uh, The World According to Dutch, I wrote that in seven weeks. And I wrote, uh, of course, the first one in, uh, in on, on the beach in Puerto Rico. And I would just go out there. and But I wouldn't really... Uh, this one was when I was booking for another company down there. It, this only lasted three months because they ran out of money, I guess, trying to pay me, I guess. But I would go down there, and I'd just go out on the beach, and I'd come up with these stories that, you know, these stories are that they should be required reading for all wrestling fans, and they should be required reading for all first-year rookie wrestlers. They should read this and find out how the wrestling business used to operate because you tell kids now how it operated, they don't believe you. They look at you like, what the fuck? Get the fuck out of here. You fucking crazy. You know, I tell them, the, I'll be telling them like heat stories, having actually fighting fans, fighting them going in. Well, you know the story. You used to do it. You'd have to, uh, you'd have to battle these fans because it wasn't boring. I'll say that. When you go to the matches in Puerto Rico, sometimes we'd, they would, we'd be in big stadiums, 16,000 people. There. You couldn't give 16,000 tickets away in Puerto Rico now. But we would have 16,000 people there, and when they would, and we didn't have music, they just ring a bell. Ding, 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 ding. And we would wait sometimes three, four, five minutes in the dugout because kids would get on top of the dugouts uh, uh, you know, with rocks in their hands. And so when we would run out, if we wanted to take our time and strut out there, they'd beat the dog shit out of you. <laughs> so I remember one time Abdullah was coming back from the ring, and the fans ran out of the stands and encircled the infield you know, where the sand is, and they were throwing so much stuff at him. I swear to God, it resembled a biblical stoning because they were beating <laughs> the crap out of him. And I was drinking that night as I drank most nights in Puerto Rico just to get through it, and there was a two-by-four laying in the dugout, and I tried to help him, so and it was broken and it had a jagged edge on it. I picked up that two by four and I sidearmed it out of the dugout into the crowd and it went zoop, zoop, and it hit a guy, bam. Boy, I saw the blood fly and him drop. It scared the crap out. I thought I'd I thought I'd killed him. Oh Jesus. I bet he still wonders today, where in the hell did that two by four come from? But anyway, when they saw that, I mean that had stopped on throwing stuff and then Abdullah barely made it back to the wrestling room and they was you know, he was kinda beat up too because those people See, they thought hey, Jonathan the Bull. space program was fake and wrestling was real. <laughs> and they would just beat the crap out of you all the time. I couldn't walk down more than two steps on the street. Jonathan dangerous. Bull told us a story one time in Memphis about it. him and Luke were down there, and the fans actually tried to, forced the heel locker room door open and had, like, Jonathan by the legs was trying to pull him out, and the other heels had him by the arms <laughs> trying to keep him in. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because, you know, they had – Kane saved me one night down there. I called this crazy-ass finish in this town, and we was in a smaller place. Still had about 3,000 people in there, packed in. And I had to make it back to the dressing room, but the people came out of the stands, so they had me blocked. So I tried to go this way. I couldn't go. That way couldn't go. Finally, I just had to try to bust through them. And I made it almost to the edge – of the, it was like a high school gym. They call them conscious. I made it to the edge of the bleachers, and then when I went, I, I fell. I went down somehow, and then next thing I know, I got a big kick right in the face. Uh. But 14, 14 or 16 stitches over my eye. So when I got up, if you stay down, they, you know, you won't get up. So I had to get up, and I was still fighting the way back. And I remember getting in the back. I'm fighting these three or four guys, and Glenn, he opened the door to the dressing room. And he looked out, and they saw how big he was, and he just reached out, and he just grabbed me and pulled me in and slammed the door. He saved me that night. Because <laughs> when he opened the door, they looked at how big he was. They said, oh, God. You know, they yeah. all had me pretty pretty well fucked up. So, But just, I went in just there. Just visually. And that's when I got in a big argument. I got in the back, and I went, God damn it. F this. Fuck this shit. I'm quitting. What the hell? And I remember they had the owner of the company. He came over there, and his name was Joe Vika. And this is another crazy deal. He's, he's from Croatia. But he went through Canada, and he ends up in Puerto Rico. And he couldn't speak English, and he couldn't speak Spanish either. So it was a, it was a mess. Joe Vico, I he said, couldn't speak Spanish. No, he was a <laughs> shit. He couldn't hardly speak that damn English. 
and he come in and he said, that is the problem. He sounded like Hitler. If he had a little mustache, look just like Hitler. <laughs> that is the problem. I said, the problem? You're looking at the goddamn problem. Look at me. I'm, I'm there bleeding like a stuck pig, you know. And I said, your, your, your security sucks. And he went, no, I have good security. I said, shit, they couldn't. The, your, my 14-year-old daughter was better than your security out there. <laughs> I'd be safer with her guarding me out there than them jack-offs. And one night, the other guards got mad. They just walked out and just left us. So it was us against the fans. It was crazy down there anyway. Well, and, and, but when you tell that story to, to, to like, first-time wrestlers, oh, it's a great story. Well, they don't believe you. And, hell, I, sometimes I don't even believe it either. I made good money down there, but I earned every penny because it was, it was a life-altering experience every time you'd go to any of the matches down there. Well, people have a hard time realizing what the, the atmosphere was like because not only was it a time where wrestling was taken more seriously in the United States as a whole, but in Puerto Rico, you were on local broadcast television, a highly rated TV show on an island that, that you can drive across in a couple hours, so it's not like you can hide anywhere. Everybody knew who you were. Wrestling was big. It was ingrained in the culture. And like you said, on an, on an island of, of San Juan and a couple other mid-sized cities, you're drawing 15, 20,000 people uh, to regular weekly and bi weekly shows in ballparks during the hot periods. Yep. It, it, it's everybody knows who the fuck you are. So it's not well, like. Well, down there, you know, you had cable, but nobody had cable. You know, the saturation, what, I guess what they call the saturation point of uh, or the pinnacle, I don't know what they call it. But only like 20% had had cable down there. So you didn't have to worry about cable as, a, as competition. Because you had your over-the-air local Puerto Rican stations that they watched. Yeah. Now, what was what was Memphis's ratings in their heyday? Oh my God, the the, the rating numbers were probably at a forties, fifties. The share was above a seventy in some cases, uh, I mean, which I, means basically seven out of ten of the televisions that were that were turned on at that point in time in Memphis were watching Saturday morning wrestling. Yeah. And it, I never it thought I never thought the rating was that high. I thought the rating was like a twenty or twenty one. That's the highest they ever got, which is a hell of a rating still. But well, the still, but yes. the but the share was a seventy. I remember that. Well, and, and you it, might you might be right about the ratings, but they were pretty close in 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 Puerto Rico in a lot of cases, right? Yeah, they those, were, and the, the highest they ever got in Puerto Rico was an eighteen three, and that was that was in like year, I don't know, two thousand maybe. I got a. Yeah, I worked for Carlos for a while, and then one day I went in there and I said, I, I need more money. So I went in there and asked for more money, and he says, well, you know, we're not really making any money. I went, what? You're not making any money? I says, you couldn't prove it by me. So anyway, we had a discussion, a, a disagreement over money. So when you got competition, all you got to do is talk to the competition. And uh, the other person who opened up down there was called Victor Quinones, unless you know anything about – Puerto Rican wrestling, you know, these are just names, but he he ran an opposition c company. So I went down there and I told him, I said, listen, if you can give me this, I'll come to work for you. Had it in five minutes. I had the same deal I asked Carlos for, plus a trip home every month, plus a place to stay, transportation. I had ex exactly what I wanted. So I went to work for him. And when I took over, his rating was a 2.6. Carlos was doing like a 14. You know, I was booking over there. We was doing like a 12 or a 14. Average, a normal week, week. So, uh, 2.6, I said, guys, a Viagra commercial will get a 2.6. <laughs> so, I went to work and took me about three months. And then Carlos's rating started falling. And the company I was working for started raising. And so, we were moving. We'd go to a 3.4. Then we'd go to a 3.8. Then we'd go to a little more. And, Finally, after about three months, we were both at about an eight, but he had fallen six points. We have come up six points. Yeah. So, and then I brought Kane down, you know, my old buddy Kane, because I'd had him down there for Carlos before. So I brought him down from WWE, and we did this big show. And from that point on, we stayed we, for the next three years, you know, we uh, we hit that high ratings, and Carlos was, was just struggling over there. And I like Carlos. He's a good guy. That's how... You know, I drew a lot of money with him, but hey, it's just business. But anyway, well, hey, well, this this brings up something though, because a lot of people, I and I, once again, I see about how the business has evolved and styles have in ring styles have evolved, and 
I, you know, I always like say, yeah, we evolved from 5,000 5, seat arenas to 500 seat rec centers. But people say that old fashioned booking won't work in a national company today or a modern company. Well, that, that, let's say Puerto Rico out of the equation. But uh, during your time with TNA Creative, two of the most well received programs, angles, rivalries, whatever you want to call them, um, that, that made it to air. Were, were Gail Kim and Awesome Kong, a, a monster heel and an underneath fighting baby face, smaller baby yep. face, yep. and Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe, and not even the MMA influence that they put in it because of their styles in the match, but just the idea it was a classic number one contender, baby face, training to face a heel, world champion, and not actually doing a goddamn angle between them every week leading up to the thing where you expect them to pay to see it but when you well, got that's, it that's, that's those things, they worked they worked yeah I, t- I tell that story i tell it in my book we sit around one of our infamous booking meetings it was me and vince and jeff and rudy and i don't know if you were i don't think you were there i was not i never i never was in any meetings with the other guy <laughs> okay but anyway and i says guys why don't we do this uh, we were going for Bound for Glory, which I give it its name, by the way. I give the name Bound for Glory. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. I'm probably reading some goddamn Civil War book or something. But <laughs> it actually, uh, the, it the, was, the name was, came was, Bound for Glory. We were looking for a card. So somebody handed me a, a list of all the talent, and we were all looking at it. Like, I don't know what the fuck we were looking at. I said, and finally, I says, guys. This is the same shit we saw a year ago. It's the same names. I mean, what the hell? I says, it's not going to change. So why don't we do something different? And I, they said, what? I said, why don't we start a female division, a, a woman's division? And nobody was for it. Everybody was just, oh, they, they looked at me like I'd spit on the Pope or something. Like, are you serious? A woman's division? Are you crazy? You know? So we didn't get anything done that day, and then the next week I brought it up again, and then the next week I brought it up again. Finally, I got the go-ahead to go ahead and see if I could find some girls, and so we brought it in, and we started at Bound for Glory, and nobody messed with them but me. I booked them, and Scott Damore was the agent, and that's the way we did it. And I told the girls, I said, girls, this is what we're going to do when I got in. We had, we had Kong. We got Gail Kim. Uh, we got a few more ODB, Dirty White Girl. What was Dirty White Girl's name? Uh, what was her name? Uh, well, <laughs> I forgot, one, but you o- know what o- I'm talking o- about. O-D-B, ODB were her initials. O- ODB, yeah. Okay. She never got to say her name because it would have violated <laughs> standards and practices. <laughs> but anyway, finally I told him in that first meeting with him, I said, girls, you're no longer whores and you're no longer sluts and bitches and cunts. You're athletes. And so I, what I want you to do now, and they responded to that. I said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out there, and I want you to turn these matches in. And I said, I want you to beat the guys. That's all I had to say. And, boy, they went out there, and they busted their ass. And for the next year or two, always the knockout division, when I would put Kong out there, you know, she would always draw the highest rating because she was a big monster. And she was a, a diva. She wasn't 125, 130 pounds. She was like 280, 290. And I remember the first time she walked out on TNA TV, you heard these big footsteps. Boom, boom. And uh, she came, and the people set up. They said, what the hell is this? Because she was so totally different. And nobody liked her. Well, she doesn't really look the part. She don't look this, look that. I went to the ring one day before the before the show aired, before we started taping, and two guys were telling her to do this and do that and do this. And I called them over there. I said, guys, what are y'all doing? He said, well, we're trying to tell her how to work. I said, no. I, I tell you, don't y'all, you guys tell her nothing. Maybe she could tell you guys something. And they said, what? I said, how to draw some money. Maybe she can <laughs> tell you that. So just, I don't want you telling her how to do it. I said, I don't want her going off her feet. And I use the Abdullah the Butcher theory. She's a monster heel, and that's yes. what I made her. They were and my sister, my so sister so hates. So she hates her. wrestling. She won't watch it. But she, she'd have her two grandsons. They'd be watching the show, and she'd tell me, 
uh, she'd tell them, tell me when Awesome Kong comes on, because I want to see her. And then they said, you know, here she is. And my my sister would come and sit down, and she would just watch that segment. And when it was over, she'd get up and leave. That's all she watched the show for. Well, you know, but it was, it, it, it's, it's actually, simple. It's like you were talking about. It's simple, simple, back to basics booking. And sometimes when you do that, you know, if it worked one time, it'll work again. But, you know. Is sometimes it's in the wrestling business they try to outsmart themselves, and in outsmarting themselves, they just they they lose the people. That's what they it, do. It was true that 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 was the highest rated quarter hour of the show was the girls, the knockouts. But then that was your problem, is that couldn't go unnoticed. <laughs> and that's when he tried to fuck that up too. Oh yeah. And, and you, well, had, you had to, you had to and lock- I, he had to lobby for Kurt and Samoa Joe behind his back to actually have a wrestling angle on a wrestling show. Yep. Well, that deal was sitting out there one day, and I said, guys, let's do something different this time. They went, like what? I said, let's promote the goddamn match for a change. <laughs> Why don't we actually promote it? Are we call promoters? Should be. They said, well, what do you mean? I said, Guys, we, they can't go on TV and uh, connect every week and attack each other and hook up. I said, what is to see when the pay-per-view gets here? And that's the way, you know, sometimes I I felt like the booking went there. It was from arc to arc, pay-per-view arc to pay-per-view arc. See, I never booked that way in Puerto Rico because I never had a goddamn arc. I just had shows <laughs> that would run that would run all year long. But I said, hey, let's just have them challenge each other and uh, and let's don't have them even – be in the same ring at any given time during the buildup to the show. Kurt would just go in there and beat guys up and, and tell about how he's going to beat the shit out of uh, Samoa Joe. And Samoa Joe would just be training in the gym, telling everybody how he's going to beat Kurt Angle. That's simple. I said, if you watch, uh, if you watch UFC, that's what they do. You don't have these guys touching each other through during the buildup to it. They're just talking, 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 talking. It's a thing called anticipation. And when you can get to that point where the people anticipate who's going to win, then you got them. And that was the highest, highest. And when I say highest, is you know that's not that good. But it was the <laughs> highest pay per view rate in TNA. It and was I the never, only one. It was the only one they ever did that was actually up in serious numbers. Yeah, it was. A, it was up. Even when I, I heard uh, an unofficial number, you know, I mean, if WWE had that number, they they. They shoot themselves, but but for TNA, it was a massive, massive improvement. So, and and well, but you know you know how I would get numbers in TNA when I was there. They say, well, the pay per view buy rate was up ten percent, and I go, okay, ten percent from what? Oh, uh, well, we don't release those numbers. We don't we don't release that. Well, hell, we could have had a hundred buys last month. Now, see, so that's it's up ten percent. So now we got a hundred and ten. That's the thing is, and everybody has to understand this, even the people in the office, much less me, just a lowly producer slash agent slash whatever the fuck I was, but even you're on the creative team. They didn't tell anybody how many people ordered these fucking things, right? And no, what, no. The best guests no. were in, in a neighborhood of, you know, 7,500 or 10,000 maybe at, at, at some points and before it went south. Oh yeah. So well, when, that's Joe, the, if Joe and, and Angle did forty or fifty thousand or whatever, it was five times the difference. The point is, you actually gave them a wrestling angle involving people they could believe in, who went out and had a credible fucking match. And once that, because because shit stain didn't want to have anything to do with it. And what happens as soon as it gets popular and gets over, he makes sure it never happens again. Well, and then the next month, like you said, we went back doing the same way, and so we're back. We, we took a giant. Two steps forward, uh, one step forward, and took two steps back. So, and anyway, I after after a while, when you fight a battle and you're not winning it, you know sometimes the fight goes all of you. The fight never went out of me; just the enthusiasm did, because nothing was going to change. So, well, the, and like I say, I, I wish them the best. I hope they make ten million dollars, twenty million dollars, or whatever. But well, no, the, the the point is that we were trying to make was that. Old fashioned booking does work on a national basis in today's environment or in modern times because the shit makes sense. And if you do it with people that they, the fans believe in to begin with and, and give them a little extra credibility and get them to face each other. And, and it's interesting and they're mad for okay. a, some reasonable reason. People want to see what's going to happen. Yep. 
it's the anticipation I was talking about. You got to have them anticipate something. And, you know, in doing that, in doing that, you build a trust with the fans. And this is what I, I hate to keep going back to Puerto Rico, but I would put most of my baby faces over because I would build the trust that the baby face could win unless the heel were just a dastardly bastard and cheated. Yeah. So at the end of the show, when we would do TV, I educated the people. And say we would have – we would go to a little t- – uh, not a small place, but a medium-sized place, seat about 3,500, 4,000 maybe. But I have – on a good – on an average night, I have 3,000 people in there. <clears throat> but when the final bell rang, when the main event final bell rang, the people didn't get up and leave because I educated them that if they'll just wait, I was going to give them the trailer for next <laughs> week. And they would they ding, 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 match is over, and the people would sit there. And you could almost say, okay, wait for it, wait for it, here it comes, and then we'll start. And then for the next five minutes, they would have the after, we'd call the afterbirth, the aftermath. But that was the trailer for next week, and they would wait for that. I educated them for that. So it's the way you educate your crowd. And even when I would even do like little, what we call spot shows, I would I would give them an interview in the middle of the card. I, I would give them the same stuff that I gave them on TV. And some of those little houses that they'd only seat a thousand people, they'd have nine hundred people in there, almost almost sold out. So when you can get a smaller area like Puerto Rico, you know, to drawing like that, you know, you you I kind of had the fans. I kind of understood the fans more than they understood what I did. And so I followed that philosophy for three years. And the fans really never got wise to it, or never got tired of it, because they kept coming. Well, and, and See, even was... you take my you take my run in WWE. It's a strange when I tell people this story. They call me on a Thursday, and they says, uh, "I said hello," and the voice says, "Is this Wayne?" You know, <laughs> when you when you hear your real name, you when's go, the last uh, time somebody has called you by your real name? It wasn't uh, probably her. then. <laughs> and the and the bankruptcy judge called me by my name one time, Wayne. So anyway, they said, uh, do you, don't you live in Nashville or close to Nashville? I said, yeah, I do. They said, we were wondering if you could possibly come down to Nashville on Monday before Raw. We would like to talk to you. I said, okay, what time? They said, well, come down there about 3 o'clock. I said, Okay. So when I went down there on uh, that Monday came, and when I went down there, I I thought that what they wanted to talk to me about was NXT in Florida. That's what I thought. And I walked in about 3 o'clock. I had a meeting at 3.30 with uh, Triple H, and he explained what they wanted to do, and it was on an on-air talent to manage Jack Swagger. And that just stunned me. It floored me, to tell you the truth. I went, wait a minute. This, they want me on TV? They said, well, they need a mouthpiece for Jack because they wanted to do something with him. And they had thought of a, a couple other guys, but they were a lot younger than me. And they said their age almost precluded them from even being in the row because nobody – I mean, the story didn't fit their age group, their demographic and their age. They said, you fit perfect, and because I was an older guy. So they said, can you do a couple of interviews for us? So we need to do the interview, and then we got to go show Vince. <clears throat> I said, okay. <clears throat> so he explained to this guy, you know, just like the, the story came out, that he was an older guy, and he was disillusioned with America, didn't like the way it was going, Saw it going to dogs. It was overrun by immigrants and this, that, and the other, and he didn't like it anymore. You ever remember seeing the movie Grand Torino with Clint Eastwood? Yes, yes, Clint Eastwood. I immediately, when they said that, that was one of my that's one of my favorite movies. I immediately thought, well, I just got to channel Clint Eastwood, <laughs> and I went out there and I did two interviews, and they took them in there to Vince, and Vince saw him and he says, hire him. <laughs> <laughs> Not fire him, hire him. So, and I, this I'm the only guy I think that's ever. Did he remember? Did he remember that you were Uncle Zeb? Yeah, that's Never where the name came from. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, well, he he, he, he remembered that. <laughs> so I went down there at three thirty. I was hired at four thirty, and I was on roll that night at seven thirty. <laughs> I don't think anybody has ever been hired as quick as that. So, well, and when I walked down, and I think that was the day the Pope had died. 
and somebody says, Dutch, you're out trending the Pope on Twitter. I didn't know what the hell Twitter was then. I said, well, I don't, that's good, I guess. I, what is it? Uh, but anyway, it was a, uh, it was one of those things that just came out of the blue. And if you'd have asked me, say, when right when I left TNA, that I would be working in WWE on in a in an on air capacity, I said, "You're fucking crazy. You need to get off that black tar heroin you've been smoking or whatever, because <laughs> that shit ain't gonna happen." But it did. And it was a great run. WWE, they treated me well. I love the company. So, uh, despite of the, in spite of their writers, which are good guys, but writing for the Rochester Times Journal doesn't qualify you to be a wrestling writer. <laughs> I had one guy there. I said, "Well, how did you get that job?" He said, "Well, I applied for it." I said, "Really?" I said, "Where'd you work before?" And that's what he told me: the Rochester Times Journal. <laughs> really? What'd you write? Sports? I said, oh, "Okay, whatever." You know, going to Raw, somebody asked me one time, what's it like working for in WWE? I said, well, and I said, this is a joke. I said, what's it like working in a Chinese sweatshop, but with super inflated wages? <laughs> 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 so when you walk in there, you, you know, sometimes you walk in there and the mood, the mood of the, of the, just the tension around, you can feel it. And it depends on one person, what kind of mood Vince is in that day. Because he is, he's a workaholic. He works his ass off. Oh, he sleeps three hours a day, and he's thinking business the other times of the day. But you just couldn't walk in and say, oh, what's the mood like today? So I had to develop another way to do it. I would walk by the writer's room. And when you looked in there and you saw those writers like, you knew something was up. But if you walk by and they're going zippity doo da, zippity day, everything was everything was good. Okay, so. I gotta ask you. I gotta ask you. You, if if they gave you a promo and you changed it to be D- or Dutch or in this case Zeb, mm-hmm. to, did they it, did they get grumpy with you if you changed the wording? If it was shit, you would say that way, or or did they let you? Obviously, you of of all people have the freedom to to tinker with shit they never really said anything a lot to me about my interviews i would change some things on the fly but they never said anything at all long as the long as the intent uh and where they wanted it to go i mean if i changed the major thing yeah they would say something but otherwise i would just go out there and I, sometimes some i i I've learned that it's better to ask forgiveness than to ask permission. Because when you go in there and you start saying, can I say this? No, no, I damn don't say that shit. You're crazy. What the fuck? You know, well, so yeah, I, just, exactly. I just make some stuff up sometimes as, as I went along. So I came up with the Alberto de Rio. And, I lo- and Vince just loved that, they said. And I did the little sneaking thing, like, you know, walking and sneaking across the border. The only two rules I had uh, with with the writers was they wanted me to get in, especially when I talked, talked about Del Rio, they wanted me to roll the R, like Alberto Del Rio. They said, get that in, because Vince loves that. And the other thing, they always want me to do the little the fingers sneaking across the border. Get that in, and we're fine. So that's the only rules you know, that, that I really had. And I, I never really had any trouble with What I had trouble with is sometimes you would have a promo, and then about 30 minutes before you go out there, they said, no, we took that back here. Here's a new, here's a new one. Yeah, so you've been working. You'd be working on this one for like an hour or two, and you got it. Then they just hand you a new one. <laughs> that sometimes would be totally different. Totally well, I, different I, from the from the other one. At, at one time at a, at a Ring of Honor, uh, no, it was a TNA taping. As a matter of fact, it was a TNA taping. We were at Universal in Orlando. And I was the wrestling czar, the the voice of authority, whatever I ever ended up being, the management director, whatever. I had 18 different phrases, none of them stuck. But uh, I was having to make rulings on a couple of different things in a couple of different segments, <laughs> right? I remember this. And You got and confused. Like, well, and, and they started, as I went out with one prop for one thing or one belt, they said, no, we're doing the other thing. But it on my format, it had the order that I was going in. And they said, oh, no, sir, that was changed, blah, blah, blah. And finally, I just got on one of the headsets and screamed, God damn it, the fucking director of authority is not doing a goddamn thing until somebody can tell me with some degree of authenticity which segment we're doing fucking next. Well, I should have been there, but that was probably one of the times I was hiding out in the back. <laughs> 
<laughs> you were in the TV truck. Where is Doug? We don't know. We haven't seen him in like the last hour, so he must be hiding again. So I'd be in the back right now. Uh, so anyway. Hey, well, listen, uh, before we wrap the show up, we talked about your books before, and you got to tell my favorite story. Uh, The the both books are called The World According to Dutch and Tales from a Dirt Road. And it's amazing that you wrote Tales from a Dirt Road in less time because it's thicker, because I'm holding both of them here. I I love these books. Oh, which one is the green one? The green one is Tales from a Dirt Road. You you took oh, yeah. less well, that, time that to was, find you know, it. I th- had that wrong before. I thought I told it wrong. That was a seven week book. Oh, and the other one is a five week book. Now you change your story. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not under oath. I'm not like Hillary. I'm not <laughs> under oath, so I can change everything because you can't. So I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I'm gonna be like a politician now. Yeah, but what is your favorite story? Well, my favorite story, and it goes back to Nashville. So many of your career defining moments have happened in Nashville, but it was the the story of Randy Savage in the Waffle House. And I I remember this was when Nick was still running. Uh, his yep. own promotion opposite to, to, to Jarrett. So we didn't get to see these matches, but people might not know you had a long program with Randy Savage for the mid America title. And you guys had great match, and Bobby Eaton was involved in that too. And that great matches at the time, but Randy, yeah, was good. More, he made well, Randy, was, inside Randy inside. was starting, Randy, Randy was starting and I was kind of starting out too. And he was starting to develop his uh, macho man uh, gimmick. And I've often said that Randy Poffo morphed into Randy Savage, who then morphed into Macho Man. It didn't matter what time of day you saw Randy in those days, he was always full-blown Macho Man mode. If yeah. you saw him at 6 o'clock in the morning, oh, yeah, that's 6 o'clock. 12 o'clock at night, oh, yeah, he was Macho Man 24 hours a day, and that's what he morphed into. But in the Waffle House story... It was late at uh, kind of about 12 o'clock at night. We'd had the match. This was on a Wednesday night. We had the local matches in Nashville on Wednesday, and I had wrestled him that night, and he had went out with Rip Rogers to a <laughs> local Waffle House, I think on Harding Place in Nashville, and they live close to there. And he went in, and Savage was wanting to get something to eat, and he was always you know, kind of intense anyway. And uh, he was trying to order, and a guy came through the door, and he might, he worked there on first shift. He was a cook on first shift. I found out later. And he said, "Hey everybody, I, I'm getting married." And they just stopped everything. And everybody said, oh, "Congratulations!" And they were laughing and applauding. Well, that stopped Randy from giving his order. And he was hungry and he's irritable any anyway. And so when he kind of died down, you know, when you gonna get married? I'm gonna get married here. And finally, Randy couldn't leave it alone, and he says. And it got, kind of got quiet in there. And it's only Randy and Rip and the cook. There's the only ones in the Waffle House. And Randy says, who gives a fuck? <laughs> oh, my God. Well, that's a direct challenge to the guy. And the guy was embarrassed. And now he's he's got to make a stand for his woman. So he says, well, you better give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> that was a witty repose. Yeah, you better give a fuck. Like, well, why would he even give a shit anyway? And Savage says, well, I don't. He says, well, you, by God, better. And so the guy started walking toward Randy's in the booth, and Randy stood up. And uh, uh, Randy says, we got a problem. The guy says, I don't know, do we? And all of a sudden, the fight just started broken out, uh, breaking, breaking out. And they started swinging at each other, and they had a big... They had a big jukebox there. I call the Wurlitzer jukebox, and they wallowed in front of that for a while. And finally, the guy pulled a knife, and Randy hopped over the counter, and he grabbed a knife. And now they were in the seats like an old Earl Flynn, you know, <laughs> m- m- <laughs> mouth tear movie. And they were trying to sword fight each other. And somebody <laughs> said, here come the cops. So the guy, the cook, he ran out the door. And Savage looked down. He didn't even have a knife. He had a butter knife in his hand, so he couldn't have cut the guy anyway. So finally, the cops come in. Everybody knew Savage in Nashville because, you know, the TV, he was all over that TV. And a lot of people watched wrestling matches in those days. And even though if you if you weren't even a wrestling fan, if you come by a guy doing an interview and said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, well, you're going to stop and watch him because it sounded like a crackhead years before crackheads even were even invented. So... And the cops knew him, and they come in and said, okay, Randy, calm down. No, man, no, man, no, man. He was all excited. They couldn't calm him down. And finally, they said, well, we gotta, we're going to have to get some cuffs on you. And so they tried to get cuffs on him, and Sabbath starts fighting them. 
and they can't get it on him, and one pulls a mace out, tries to mace Savage, misses. He hits the other cop in the eye. The other cop is laying around, and he drops his club. Now Savage picks up his club, and now you know, Savage wasn't trying to hit the cop. The cop is trying to hit him. He's just blocking, and finally the cop pulls back him. Now more cop cars are coming. Now, if anybody's familiar with a Waffle House, it has floor-to-ceiling windows. Yes. You know, those full lengths. You can see everything inside there from the from the from the out from outside. So here comes some more cops. Finally, the here comes the lieutenant in. He knew Randy, and he called him by his name. He said, "Now, Randy, calm down." And no man, you letting the other guy get away. He's the one. He I was attacked. This, that, and the other. And they they try to get him again. They can't get him. So finally, they said, "Bring the dog." So when they brought the canine in there, the canine unit, and they went after Savage. And you know the old saying, he ripped him a new asshole. Well, <laughs> that was true in this case because that dog bit Randy on his butt cheek about six, eight inches. And he, they finally got him handcuffed, got him in the car, and got him down to the station and locked him up. And I didn't see him till Saturday night in Chattanooga. And he, he said, look, this is what this dog did to me. So he pulled his trunks down, a big bite mark on his ass. I said, well, but that's look what happened. What, that was, what this dog did to me, man. Can you, oh, yeah. And I bet, and Randy never forgot anything. If anybody ever slided Randy at all, he never forgot. And I bet, you know, to his dying day, I bet Randy sometimes sat up at night and saying, I gotta go kill that dog. <laughs> he always wanted he always wanted to get back at somebody and but you know Savage couldn't leave it alone because the big article came out about it. Well, shit, Randy couldn't let that shit go by. He called a writer down at the, the local paper, the Tennessee and in Nashville, and he gave his version. Of course they're gonna they're gonna carry it. And he came in there, but he was very complimentary of the Nashville cops and, you know, said it's a misunderstanding and 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 they ran it, so but nothing came of it. I think I think uh, Nick Goulas gave a donation to the damn police fraternity order or whatever, and they had it they had it reduced well, and that, thrown that out or something. Be, but that, he never he never went to court on it. I think he may have paid a small fine. That's it. That, that must be the way that that it, everything got covered up and smoothed over. Was the promoter was so well known in town and so well connected, they'd give a donation to the appropriate offended party or do whatever and and guys would get you know get away with shit so it didn't hurt the business and now, oh, yeah. try that now it's, with it'd be on the internet in three minutes anyway but uh oh yeah it's, but that's the way it worked and uh and, and a lot of ways probably worked better because randy didn't really hurt anybody you know he just got a big bite on the ass you know and no cops got hurt nothing but even though you know a lot of people fight cops all the time hell nothing happens to them either so shit I guess Randy was just a forerunner of all that stuff. You see, he would have been a TMZ uh, oh, he know, would have. poster boy. But Well, let me ask you this before we let you go. Where you've got two Twitter accounts, first of all. Clarify this for everybody. Where can we, <laughs> how can we follow you on Twitter, and how can we find the schedule of your, your uh, comedy club dates and stuff coming up? Where, what's the best thing to do? Okay, my, my next comedy day is September the 15th, which is next week, Thursday next week. It's in, uh, it's in Chattanooga at the Comedy Catch Club. And uh, my Twitter account, I have two, and I'll tell you how I got one. I had one called uh, Dirty Dutchman One. That was my first one. Yeah. And that's on Twitter. My second one is Dirty D Mantel. That's the handle, you know, with the little at symbol in front of it. But it does, it still says Zeb Coulter, and I have 220,000 followers there. <laughs> one thing about WWE, when I left, <clears throat> they'll let you keep your account. Unless they're mad at you. <laughs> and uh, I asked, I said, well, how can I keep this? They said, oh, you can keep them because they're not mad at you. They said, they've been mad at some people, and they just canceled the whole account. So the second one is uh, Dirty D Mantel uh, Twitter, and the other one is Dirty Dustman 1. I have two. And I just, go, I, I just go back and forth between them. When I was still Zeb, I used to, I used to uh, deny knowledge of Dutch. I never knew him. And Dutch didn't know him, but they hate. I actually worked my own program on Twitter with myself. It has been schizophrenic, <laughs> yes. Where, where you were, many times you were upset at your other, your other. I alter my ego. alter ego, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I would forget what account I was on and post as the other person. And somebody said, "Well, why are you sounding like Zeb?" Oh, I said, "Oh, good." Then I had to go in there and delete that, and I was always trying to outsmart myself. 
But you anyway. got to have a website now too. You got to have a, a dirty Dutch com or something built coming up. You got well, to- I'm working. I'm working on that, and uh, I'm working. I'm working on a lot of stuff right now. I'm not doing nothing. I'm just sitting around. I'm just. <laughs> I'm just. Uh, you know, when they talk about, oh, I like to go. A lot of people say, oh, I like to go to WWE. Yeah, well, it sounds great. It sounds good. You make good money. It's very good. But I'm gonna tell you, when they when you travel, brother, it is brutal. We were yeah. in Europe. We were in. I was in France. I was in Paris. Flew out that night to, or the next morning to Madrid, Spain, or somewhere in Spain, for an afternoon show. I only stayed there three hours. Then got on a plane tonight. Went to Milan, Italy. Worked another show, and then I went to somewhere else. I worked three shows in eighteen hours, and before well, from one bed to the next bed in the hotel was twenty six hours. And that is a long, long day. And that's now, when you think, when I think about going to Europe, I think about all the damn terrorist attacks and all. I'd, I'd be, I, actually, I'd be I afraid to go. Over there. I'm, I'm, a, I'm about to go to England, and I don't need any help being nervous. So quit. You know how I am. No, Let's England's okay. It. England's all right, all right. All right. No, I'm okay now. But last week I was in rough shape. You know. <laughs> So when are you going to England? I'm the the first uh, week of October. I'll be over well, there good. in front of people on the fifth, the sixth, and the eighth. Well, that's very good. Witten, I'm going. Witnesses. I'm going back in January. I'm going there for four KW, I think, or something. One of those groups over there. So I'll be there in the end of January. So. Well, you and you got to come back on this show quicker. And also, we had some technical difficulties that folks don't even know about because our producer Styles Bitchley is such a fucking genius at covering this stuff up. But so you got to come back that on the show before that bastard before January. Before I'll come back on the show when I get back, and then I'll 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 tell you uh, promote your your trip over there, and we'll just talk about England. I'll do it. And I'd like to close this by saying I want every real American within the sound of my voice to please rise. Put your hand over your heart and in a loud, clear voice, say along with me, we the people. That's all I got to say. I would I would do the same thing, except oftentimes I'm asked to stand and and, the, the, <laughs> and do a deposition <laughs> and do a deposition to the people. But anyway, thank you, Dutch. It's it, it's been worth the wait to have you on the show. And, and well, uh, well, stay in contact with me and. Uh, Follow me on Twitter, people. Uh, people, and uh, I, I love I love talking to you, Jimmy, and love doing this show. And uh, let's let's connect a little quicker next time. Well, and I, I promise I won't sign any contracts that will prohibit me from from uh, being able to talk to you in public. If if you won't sign any contracts that will prohibit you from being able to talk to me in public, we'll do this again very soon.